any minute now, a hooded man will come barreling out of nowhere and kill me. So that sucks. I know this because it's happened six times before. I wake up in this alley, hung from a post by a piece of rope lashed to one ankle, tied in a hangman's knot. After several minutes of work, I pry my bonds free, and about 30 seconds after I hit the ground, this guy in a black hooded robe gives me a pretty bad case of death. His hands are cold on my neck, and dry. I try to fight him to claw at his eyes, but I can't reach. I scratch at his arms. He's too strong. I try to yell at him. I manage more of a gurgle and some clicky noises. I don't even know what I'd say, but I can assure you he seems like a real dick. Everything goes all fuzzy and fades to grey, then black. I die. And then I go someplace else. I don't know. I can't remember that part just now. Anyway, I guess I should try something different this time. I fold at the waist, my fingers picking at the knot while I think it over. I've tried running out of both ends of the alley, tried fighting the guy. All of these failed, in spectacular fashion. I'll need to get creative this time. There's really only one other option I can think of. I get the knot loose enough to slip my ankle free of the rope and plummet to the ground, landing on my feet, which immediately slide out from under me to plant my lower back in a mud puddle. Nice. I hop up and pop the lid of a dumpster open and lift myself so I'm sitting on the lip. Flies circle near my face before returning to their bacteria buffet. I totter forward, my hands latching onto the metal sides to stop my momentum. My chest heaves in and out with a single deep breath. This may not be the best idea I've ever had, I suppose, but I'd rather avoid getting strangled, so what the hell? I plunge feet first onto the parlour trash. I sink, and bags shift to flop their limp weight on top of me. Garbage water squishes around me. It's juicy as hell in here, and it smells like liquid arse. I can't see the soft mass resting under my hands and knees, but if I had to guess, dead dog. I never get a look at his face. The hooded man, I mean. He somehow tucks back into the shadow under the hood. I can make out the outline of his chin one corner of his wet mouth, but that's it. For now, all I can make out is a little light streaming between the sacks of waste above me and the aforementioned juicy odour. I wait, and wait. I consider poking my head out to breathe some semi-fresh air, but I decide against it. It would be dumb to submerge myself in putrid liquid like this only to get strangled for trying to breathe oxygen that smells like 90% sewage instead of 300% sewage. I can tough it out. After petting the dog for a few minutes, I hear footsteps rush into the alley and hesitate. This is it. I feel like I finally appreciate what the cliché, when the shit hit the fan means. Because in the dumpster, it smells exactly like someone threw a bunch of logs into spinning blades. The footsteps creep closer, and there's a sloshing sound. I picture his foot sinking ankle deep into a pothole turned mud puddle, and almost laugh. Maybe I'm covered in piss and dead dog juice, but he has a wet foot now. He scampers past the dumpster, pausing at the end of the alley before moving on. Interesting. This is a new development in our game of cat and guy choking cat. As much as I want to get the F out of this dumpster, I should wait here a moment longer before I move out. Give them some time to create some distance between us. I stand and my head emerges from the debris just enough to get a peek at the end of the alley. Nothing. 
I hold my breath and listen for a moment. Nothing. Suddenly, it strikes me that it really is nothing. No cars going by, no pedestrians around. This seems important, but I can't think of why just now. I pull myself out of the dumpster, but my foot catches on the rim and I splat face first on the asphalt. Fuck, I say. It occurs to me immediately that I've said this altogether too loudly, considering I am trying, you know, not to get murdered. I bring my hand away from my cheekbone. It's bloody, with a bunch of sand stuck in it. I look up, and there he is, standing at the end of the alley, just standing there. I try to think of a name or something to call him, but none of them seem dramatic enough to do this scenario justice. I mean, what can you say to the guy that's about 30 seconds away from snuffing your life out for the seventh damn time? Did I already mention that this guy's a real jerk? I run. I reach the other end of the alley and bank to the left and keep going. My feet pound the pavement and I can hear his footsteps echoing mine, drawing closer. I take another sharp left at the intersection, hoping to gain a little ground with the change of direction. For the first time, I realise how grey everything seems. The sky, the buildings around me, the street, the sidewalk. It doesn't seem right. This place isn't normal. I tried to remember what I was doing before I woke up in the alley, but I can't. I cut left again at the next intersection guess out of habit at this point. His footsteps are much louder now, close. I sneak a peek over my shoulder just in time to see his outstretched hand reach for the back of my collar. I duke away from him and veer left. He follows, reaches out again. Just as I think I should probably look where I'm going, I slam into the dumpster and drop to the ground like a bag of sand. I guess that's what four left turns gets you. My fall is so fast, he can't slow down in time and kicks my head, which sends him... Wait, let me rephrase that. I heroically place my head in the perfect spot to trip him, which sends him sprawling into the same mud puddle I fell in earlier. I can literally see some stars from the cranium kick, but you should see the other guy. He's soaked. I pull myself to my feet. I'm too wobbly to run, so I lean against the dumpster. Ah, uh, what the hell. I crawl back into the dumpster, face first this time. If this guy wants to kill me, fine. But let's just say he's probably going to have to touch a dead dog to do it. I hear him move towards the trash bin. And then there's a familiar metallic sound that I can't quite place. After a very brief lull, I hear what sounds like him jabbing his hand into the garbage. He jabs again and then three more times in rapid succession. Except, I see his hand plunge through the garbage about three inches from the tip of my nose. And it's weird, because his hand looks exactly like the blade of a ridiculous combat knife. Like if you just kill a dinosaur, you would use this thing to skin it. Otherwise, it'd be too big to have any practical purpose I can think of. So, this is yet another new development. He's wielding a knife. How wonderful. I watch the knife jabs work their way away from me to the other end of the dumpster and then start their way back. I know I shouldn't move, that if I move he'll see exactly where I am. But once he's within about a foot and a half of me, I can no longer resist the urge to put the dead dog on top of me for protection. Before I can even lift the carcass though, the knife skims my ear and enters that ball of muscle that connects the neck and the shoulder. This is the opposite of awesome. He pulls the knife out, and without thinking about it, I lie back, I guess to shrink away from my attacker. I feel the wet warmth surge along the back of my neck. Things suddenly seem quiet, and I realise that I must have been screaming and just stopped. The knife plunges through the trash once again, this time sinking into my torso two inches lower than my sternum, that soft space between the ribs. I grab his hands around the handle of the life and try to hold the blade in so he can't keep at it, but he yanks it away without any real trouble. 
The place where the knife was in my belly feels empty, a little cold. Like if you hold your mouth open and let the cool air touch everything in there. Except a lot more painful. I really need to figure out how I got here. Who just wakes up in an alley that's all empty and shit, hanging upside down by the foot? Someone must have put me here, I guess. But who? And why? And how do I even keep coming back? Who resurrects in this day and age? I think I'm in shock. Like now, I'm out on the asphalt again. I guess he must have pulled me out of the dumpster. I don't know. It's getting hard to keep my eyes open, and everything is a little blurry around the edges. I see the hooded man swing back into focus, and I realise he's completely soaked. His robe looks like he's been rolling around in mud. It's a mess. So that's good. The first thing that drifts into my consciousness is some soft rock song. It sounds like it's playing far away. I don't know what it's called, but I know I've heard it before. It blows. The next thing I'm aware of is a warm breeze tickling my forehead in steady bursts. His eyelids are fluttering, a voice says. Now, this voice is entirely too close to my face. It does not sound like the voice of someone you want close to your face. It sounds like the voice of a guy with a moustache that eats a lot of spaghetti. And it sounds like he's close enough to smear marinara on my cheek with a simple flick of the tongue. When I first open my eyes, however, it's too bright to make out more than a silhouette hovering over me. I managed to keep my eyes open for a fraction of a second, but I'm left with more questions than answers. Am I in hospital? Is this a doctor? I clutch at my belly, but there's no bandage or any other sign of a knife wound. I think he's waking up, the voice says. A murmur of other voices respond. There have to be at least 15 other people gathered nearby. Okay, so that seems like a lot for a hospital room. And, thinking it over for a moment, the moustache voice doesn't sound all that educated. Then the smell hits me. The warm breeze I felt on my forehead smells like Funyuns. To be more specific, it smells exactly like Funyun breath. So I guess Dr Funyun is mouth-breathing on my face. Are you awake, buddy? He says. Yes. I open my eyes just in time to see the guy wheel round to face all the ladies standing in a semicircle around me here in the U-scan aisle at the supermarket. Major, to be precise. He says yes, he says. We can hear him, an old lady clutching a tabloid to her chest says. Her voice sounds like she smokes tubes of actual tar instead of cigarettes. The man turns back to face me. I sense right away that the grin plastered on his face is genuine. Also, I was right about the moustache. A black Tom Selleck style, flecked with grey. Name's Glenn Floyd, he says, holding his hand out for me to shake. I'm Jeff Grobniger, I say. I sit up, and he claps me on the shoulder instead of a handshake. One of those hard shoulder claps, usually reserved for awkward encounters between gym teachers and students. You scared me, man, he says. I haven't seen someone fish out like that since the time Ricky bought a nitrous tank to the party shack back in college. He lifts the navy blue baseball cap off his head and runs his fingers through his hair. Fish out, I say. Oh yeah, he says. You were flopping around like a fish, buddy, trying to bite the floor and stuff. It was wild. Must have been one of them grand mal seizures or something, right? A couple of ladies behind him nod gravely. A woman strides up on us with a cell phone pressed to her ear. She's wearing pleated front car keys and a fancier version of the major polo shirt. So I take her as some kind of manager. Are you feeling all right, sir? She says. Yeah, I'm fine. I'm glad to hear that. We've called an ambulance, so we'll need you to sit tight till they get here, she says. I get to my feet. What? No, no. I'm not getting in any ambulance. I detect a hint of panic in my voice, so I try to do a nonchalant shoulder shrug to conceal it, like, 
I'm not getting in any ambulance because I'm cool. Not terrified in the slightest. Glenn squints and gives a nod of approval. I think the major lady buys it as well. Sir, it's store policy for us to have you wait here until medical professionals can assist you, she says. This is in the best interest of your well-being, as well as our store's insurance purposes. Well, I happen to have a very strict policy regarding me not going to the hospital. Glenn chuckles. Oh, man, he says. I hate to toot my own horn, but I'm getting the distinct sense that Glenn is very impressed with me. Ah, I lied earlier. I love tooting my own horn. I turn towards the door, moving quickly. Grobnagger, Glenn says, running to catch up with me. You almost forgot your wheatgrass. And these. He shoves a little plastic planter of wheatgrass and my sunglasses into my hands. So I guess I was here to buy wheatgrass. Not sure. I'm guessing the sunglasses popped off when I fell. I slide them back on. I pretty much always wear sunglasses. Inside, outside, daytime, nighttime. Doesn't matter. I like to feel covered up, I guess. Plus, it's comforting to see the world through lenses that mute all the harshness out there. It's like having a dimmer switch for reality. For a second, I think maybe the old man who says hi and bye to everybody is going to try to physically stop me from leaving the store with some kind of crazy old man neck grip or something. Instead, he just tries to guilt me into staying with a dirty look and a slow motion head shake. I cross through the doorway and step away from the building. In the parking lot, a shriek distracts me. My eyes lock on to a young couple loading groceries into the back of a Hyundai Sonata. The girl has long, scrawny limbs, an equally long face, like someone grabbed her by the head and foot and stretched all of her out when the bones were still soft as she was an infant. Still pretty, though. The guy has a low brow and muscular legs that suggest a life spent lifting heavy objects for both work and pleasure. She pushes him in the chest. He totters backward. And she squeals in glee as he does a Frankenstein-like stalk after her with raised arms. He grips and lifts her in some sort of bear hug, her face going all red in laughter as her frail fists pound his chests. She could do better. As I move through the lot, shards of memory start piecing together what has happened to me here. I just rung up my wheat grass in the U-scan line when I overheard Glenn next to me. Excuse me, miss, he said to the cashier standing about 15 feet away. This item won't scan. He shook a can of Hershey's syrup at her. I watched as the cashier made eye contact with him, but didn't help. Didn't acknowledge his query at all. In fact, instead, turning and walking in the other direction. What the fuck? Glenn said in a gravelly falsetto that was almost quiet enough to be to himself. I almost laughed, but he immediately started talking to me. Do your cats eat that wheatgrass? he said. He pointed at the wheatgrass. That's what I'm about to find out, I said. It's supposed to be really good for them, he said. My cats loved it at first, and now they won't touch the stuff. Figures, right? I remember that I tried to respond to this, but it was like my mouth didn't work. First, no sound came out, even though I was telling it to. And then once I could speak, it was all garbled into stuttering nonsense. Whoa, you all right? Glenn said. And then everything faded to black... The next thing I knew, I was strung up by my left foot in an oddly grey alley.